Hello, ghouls and goblins, and welcome back to Bride of Alternate Ending. I, as always, am your ghost, Brennan Klein. And with me, also as always, is your co-ghost, Tim Brayton. How are you doing today, Tim? I'm doing real good. How are you doing, Brennan? Good. I'm doing great. I'm really excited to to be exploring a, an, I would say, iconic, just kidding, a, a, a horror franchise that neither of us has, has delved into before, I think. A, a horror franchise I did not know existed in any capacity until about five weeks ago, maybe less than that. And uh, and I don't think I realized it was a franchise until more recently still. Yeah, it, it is indeed a trilogy. Um, so, But you discovered that this exists... Well, okay, I'll, let me intro. We're, we're do- this is our second episode for our, of our 21st Century Slashers a month. We are talking about the 2009 MTV original film, My Super Psycho Sweet 16. Um, but so you heard about this before we started brainstorming for this month, but only shortly? Or was it during that process? It was during the process of brainstorming that I heard about this. Film. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Um... But yeah, I, I, I'd heard about it from, I have, you know, I have horror friends who came up in the 2000s and were just devouring everything. And so I've, I've heard about this from a couple corners, but it's not something I've dived into either. I, I feel like I can, I can make it even more abject. I think I learned that MTV made original direct-to-television movies as a result of our brainstorming session five weeks ago. Oh yeah, that's true. And then I had, a, I had my little monologue about how some of them are kind of good sometimes. Yes, you did. Um, but yes, so this is, this is what that is. Uh, I have a question. It is indeed kind of good sometimes. That is, I think, shockingly so. Yeah, it it really is. But I have a question going in that I know the answer to, but I I think it's journalistically important for me to ask. Um, have you ever seen an episode of My Super Sweet 16? I have not, but I am aware of what the thing is. Yes. Okay. Me neither. That there was not. I was not an MTV viewer um, at any point when I when I was a uh, coming of age. MTV was basically just sixteen and pregnant and that kind of stuff, and it was just not shows that I cared about. Coming of when I was coming of age, MTV played music videos. Yeah. See, I would have watched I feel it if it was that archaic and and just absolutely withered and leathered when I reflect on that fact. <laughs> but I'm I don't know. I guess YouTube did kind of nibble peck them to death, but um I was, it was long pre YouTube that MTV had pivoted over. That was that was the age when MTV two was the one showing music videos, but MTV had already oh. already begun its uh its shift into the many things it has been since it was a music video station. Okay. Well r- reality TV killed the video star and that is why we're here, I guess. This is a. Uh, the pitch was, what if we did an episode of My Super Sweet Sixteen and there was a slasher killer there? So you know, some incredibly rich sixteen-year-old throwing a lavish party, and some of them are being murdered, which is a, a which great is a, idea. an absolute just baller pitch. For the record, if I am an MTV executive, I have to go excuse myself to bang my secretary when I hear that. Like that is just <laughs> really. An insanely good pitch for a horror movie. Yeah, it is an insanely good pitch, and uh, there there is a there is a slasher movie called Sweet Sweet Sixteen that came out in eighty three, which but it's not very good, and it really has nothing to do with the concept of a Sweet Sixteen party. Which I don't know. Sweet Sixteen is not something I've ever really had an interaction with in my personal life. Like the concept of like, well, you're big... you're a boy, and so am I. Yes, but like I was friends with girls because gay. Um, mm. And my in my friend group and in my kind of area, this wasn't a big deal thing that anybody did. Um, so I'm not exactly sure when this concept crystallized. But what do you think it was around in the eighties? Even just from historic... well, I mean. I was certainly aware of it as a thing 
like I I didn't have friends of any gender when I was a teenager really so like I can't say whether it was a thing people really did but certainly in the late 80s when I was around 9 or 10 I was aware that sweet 16 was like a deal okay okay Interesting. Well, yeah. So I guess I guess they hadn't the eighty three movie had no excuse uh, to not be based around a big giant party. But this is the first that I'm aware of that's like specifically Sweet Sixteen centric. Mm-hmm. Um, since you have seen this movie more recently than me, and by that I mean you watched it last night and I watched it two or three days ago. Um, do you want to start us with the plot synopsis? I sure. I think that's that's perfectly uh, okay. So it is. Um... It is a film that begins, as many a slasher film has begun, roughly 10 years ago, where there is a roller rink who's... So So the film is set in 2009 that this implies that the roller rink exists in 1999, which feels very, very late for this kind of just absolutely cornball, dopey-looking roller rink type thing to still exist yes but the the roller rink's hook is that there is the lord of the rink haha and like that is a that is a level of labored pun that i fully buy into in terms of like yes a locally owned roller rink would think that was cute uh but for your birthday a knight like a, a man in sort of a knight in shining armor costume with a somewhat pointless full face mask because it's just a full face mask of a person so why isn't he just wearing like a crown but yeah it's it's weird it's kind of like if the phantom of the opera mask had a face printed onto it a little bit longer a little bit uh so he he like rolls up to you and and wishes upon the a finest of all birthdays you know that sort of hokey bullshit uh and so one day the lord of the rink has been called upon to uh um celebrate the birthday of some you know shitty little teen boy whose whose name I don't even know if we we learn and the shitty little teen boy decides to show off in front of his friends by making fun of of the guy in the costume and and like knocking over the cake that he's holding and just being a real real douche nozzle and this event is is what either finally pushes the 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 guy over or or maybe who knows, but he uh, he snaps and he kills both the shitty boy whose birthday it is, but also just a bunch of other kids who are there. Uh, and he is arrested for this because his daughter, his six year old daughter, watches all of this and very sadly, but knowing her duty as a law abiding citizen, uh, calls the police on her father and skip ahead 10 years and and who do you suppose is our final girl in this movie? Hmm. It is, is it? It is, it is the daughter. Is it the the shit eating kid? No. It oh, is, I was obvi- wrong. The, kid, oh, the no. kid's ghost comes back to be the final girl. No. Uh. So yes. So so ten years later, Sky Rotter. So the the killer's name was Charlie Rotter. Which I just now that I said it out loud myself, were they making a pun on Charlie Trotter somehow? Because that I doesn't make any that sense. Is. Is that? What Charlie Trotter is the owner of a uh, one of like the first major like fancy American restaurants. I think he was a uh, Chicago based or oh. Chicago New York based. Um, he must have been Chicago based. But so like like eighties era celebrity chef basically. Oh, I don't see why they would. It, but... it makes no sense. But now that I've said it out loud, it just like hit me. But uh, <laughs> so at any rate, the, the character's last name is Rotter, which feels loaded and and with a name like rotter how are you not supposed to become a, a psycho killer who who mac murders six uh 16 year olds yeah and and frankly his kind of like uh choke slam customer service rage is very relatable until he starts murdering people oh maybe it, even not but it is i mean i feel like the the film has done an excellent job of making sure that we don't feel sorry for any of the people who die very much which so. is a real important task for the slasher film to achieve um but so so sky is a pariah as one will be when one's father is a noted spree killer um so she's she's just kind of 
poking around. Uh, she lives with her aunt now and, and goes to school. And the super popular queen bee at the same school, a certain Madison, which is, of course, the name you give to your repulsive queen bee, if it's of 2009, course. Uh, it is time for her super sweet 16 party. And she has decided, and I think we actually, you know, I said it starts 10 years ago. I think it actually starts with Madison coming to the abandoned roller rink and sort of peevishly and, and in her very entitled way declaring, this is where my birthday will be because I get absolutely everything I want because I am the center of the universe for this day. Um, so Madison wants to have her sweet 16 at the roller rink. Uh, and there's some other teen drama that intervenes for the next 45 minutes, but you know, dot, dot, dot. What do you think happens when you bring a bunch of teenagers to have a party at a place where the last time it was open, a bunch of teenagers died at a party. Oh, let me guess. Let's let's guess indeed. Yeah, no, yeah. So of course, you know, Charlie Rotter returns. He's wearing the mask. It's definitely not even playing at the game of even pretending it's a whodunit. It's like, yeah, he's back, whatever. Um, and... and I mean, to me, to me, that's one of the the things that makes a slasher a slasher is that I feel like you're typically not in a ton of doubt about who the killer is even with even if in this case we are told that he burned to death in a car accident and i if if it ever clarifies when the body wasn't found i missed it so i think we're just meant to accept that there are there are norms to this genre and we just roll with it yeah well it it, the thing it was it was he was in like a prison transport vehicle with like nine other people and it said that the bodies were burned to the point that they were unidentifiable um, so it's like, well, yeah, he could have not been one of them. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't say like, oh, there was one missing or anything. They sure don't care about making us believe that it could not be him or questioning. We just are sort of like, well, yeah, this is, this is the movie we signed up for. Yeah, very much. Uh, uh but also the movie we signed up for as you, as you <laughs> generously skipped over is a, a, a soapy MTV teen drama. Um, where Sky has one of the most repulsive best friends ever. His name is Derek, and he just, he's a big walking boner. And he wants to, he's basically like, every line out of his mouth is just a desperate plea for her to allow him to finger her just once. He, he is a living embodiment of the ha-ha, just kidding, dot, 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 unless trope. Oh my god, yes. Uh, and he's actually kind of cute, but... It is just a repulsive, disgusting person. Um, yes. But she is interested in, you know, the the popular guy. He's the ex-boyfriend of Madison. His name is... His name. His name is a, a fucking journey. I swear. It, it is Brig. It is and, Brig Jenner. Oh, God. I love him so much. I love the name. I love a cheesy romantic hero name anytime you can name your your dude like chest and slab heart or whatever like i just i i love some something that just patently couldn't exist in real life yes um and it is the perfect 2009 teen hot boy idiot name um but anyway so brig also, and... also perfectly 2009 the way that we are introduced to this dynamic where they flirt with each other in the school hallway uh they flirt by her suggesting that he's having gay sex with his best friend. And it's like, oh, yes, in 2009, that is 1,000% something that would have been seen as, like, cute and not what? Yeah, oh, yeah. No, it's the, it, the time capsule of it all is really profound. Um, strangely, only one deployment of the R word, which was uh, uh, less than I was expecting. So that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit less gay panic than than not I, I think that scene is the only part that has gay panic if i recall yeah and because it's like that there's a the character of his friend who's like he says uh, uh did i write his oh yeah he that that he's introduced kevin kevin is the friend's name yes yes good good work on keeping the name straight i just thought of i in my notes i have him down as ginger friend um i mean but, that, that gets us through his role in the, the narrative perfectly yeah, fine exactly um, but he's introduced talking to Briggs saying you nailing some rando would be very bomb. Yes. 
And first of all, just mm, d- delicious, glorious uh, gumbo of 2009 slang words. Um, but also, I assumed that character was going to be the character. Like the, you know, wouldn't it be funny unless whatever character, but for for like gay lust, which is a pretty common comedic side mm-hmm. character trope around this time. And that didn't really come to fruition. Um, which I think is fine. I like as much as I like to have any gay character in a movie, we don't, we don't gotta, we don't gotta, I'd rather just not be in my super psycho sweet 16. That's fair. I will also say that the whole sequence endeared me greatly to sky because, uh, when she's when she's working with this joke and she's running with the bit and uh-huh. and to a certain extent Brig is running with the bit and Kevin's getting very like bruh, 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 I'm okay. Uh she refers to him as a quarterback and his very huffy response is, I'm a receiver. And Sky says something to the effect of like, Yeah, I bet you are. It's like, oh, that's what I would say. Yeah, I was that that is such a Tim joke. And it's it's a it's more complex than a, a teen movie sex joke would usually get. Or it's it's a little more uh, elevated. Yes. Um very little, but yes. Yeah, well Sky Rotter is aware of what a top and a bottom is. And for two thousand nine yes. gay discourse among straight people, like I don't know that that's that's happening. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, I, I was automatically on her side from that point to the end of the movie because, like, well, that's the kind of joke I would have made on our podcast today. So, oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, and the, I mean, the the, the two thousand nine trappings they just never go away, and it is it is very delightful for me. That did provide a lot of my enjoyment in this movie, and probably why I rated it a half star higher than you. <laughs> um, it's it's very Mean Girls. It's very High School Musical. Um, as far as the the fashions and and everything, um, and and also the needle drops. Okay, were there so as far as needle drops go? I don't feel like I remember noticing any songs in particular, except for the '90s sequence, which is set to "Tub Thumping" by Chumbawamba. So the, there's that, and then I feel very much sets us up. It's I don't know. Maybe it's just this is the music that I remember being sort of the ambient pop of 2009. But, like, it felt like there were six or seven moments where I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I I remember the six months when that song was ubiquitous. And uh, and I'd say that it particularly ends with such a moment in a way that is a dumb joke that really landed for me. And we'll we'll potentially get to that point because I don't want to just jump right to the... Um, the final beat of the movie. But no, to me, it, it felt like the music was a kind of relatively consistent wallpaper of things that reminded me of the, the mid and late 2000s. Yeah, no, uh, as far as like genre and vibe, definitely. And that that's kind of the thing that MTV movies and, and, and scripted TV shows were doing at the time, which is just we're going to layer in mainly a lot of music that's bubbling under that we're going to try to kind of draw attention to and also isn't mm-hmm. as expensive to to license mm-hmm. um but yeah they were all about just like a wallpaper soundtrack oh okay so this there's just there these are songs that i didn't know in 2009 so we've got nookie by lip biscuit we've got miss murder by afi i mean miss murder by afi is the the joke song that it's like oh is it oh sorry that's the I, one I, playing I, that's the one playing when she like spoil it's a it's a slasher movie yeah we know the drill it's fine yeah. the, the morning after when she's one of the solitary survivors of this massacre and she sort of stumbles her way out of the roller rink uh and we're sort of being teased with this possibility of has she inherited her father's psychosis uh-huh. uh the song miss murder is playing and it is stupid but it's funny oh yeah because <laughs> it's called miss murder I had did not know that song existed, so that that oh, joke did not land did for me. me. That was that was a real oh god. When was the last time I heard this? Like two thousand eleven, maybe. So like that that is one of the key moments for me of like oh I get this movie's game and it's a bad game, but it's being played well. Oh for sure, and and okay, so yeah, looking at this soundtrack, there's songs by Thrice. There's a song by All American Rejects. Um, this is pretty 2009. There's a song called Burning Bridges by the band Something About Vampires and Sluts. I'm not familiar with that band name, although I do think I remember this song. Oh, okay, great. Um, 
but yeah, none of the songs other than Tub Thumping were ones that I was aware of, but I wasn't okay. listening. What was I listening to in 2009? So to, 2009, oh. how old would you have been? I would have been uh, a freshman in high school. Okay. Um, and I would have, I think I was just getting into music, but at that point I was listening to like pop punk, like Amber Pacific, Blink-182, like Warped Tour kind of stuff. Um, and then also like the Beatles and Queen and and kind of plumbing the the uh, the archives. Well, I mean, Beatles and Queen are are freebies. You know, it's the center square on the bingo card. But uh, okay, good to know. No, I I wouldn't say I was listening to any of this. Like, I don't like this kind of music. This kind of very tail end of when you could still make something and plausibly call it rock, sort of poppy shit. Mm-hmm. But um. I I recognized a lot of the music just because, like, it was in the world, you know? Like, you'd walk into the grocery store or you'd, you know, wherever you hear music that you don't... Like, to, wherever you hear top 40 music that you don't yeah. really pay attention to, but it's always there. Yes, 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 yes. Um, which, these days, is not the radio. It is it is TikTok and Instagram, um, which is a very strange shift. Um, but yes, I, I, I totally... I feel that, and I'm glad that these songs were needle drops that actually had impact but i they were just so outside of my sphere of of knowledge that they didn't hit me at all um but yeah that is the thing that mtv was doing and i'm I'm glad that they they delivered to whatever degree that they could um but okay so this movie is pretty cleanly divided between teen stuff and slasher stuff Mm -hmm. um i would argue the teen side is the worst side by a considerable margin. I absolutely think that is the case, but that's also true of every single slasher movie. I think that's true. Uh, But, but this is definitely like secret life of the American teenager style soap opera antics, which isn't as common in um, slasher movies necessarily. That is true. true. But, oh my God, they're, (sighs) I don't, there's not a single actor in this movie who rises above the level of bland. Um, no, certainly not. You know, but, I, I say that, you know, Sky endeared myself to her with, with her joke, but like, she is not good. No, 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 no. She, and, and the she, actress Lauren McKnight is not good. No, she is incapable of delivering a face, a facial expression of any kind. She's, she's a starer. Um, mm-hmm. And, Brig has nothing to work with and does not play off her well. I think he's got slightly more something going on. He but... is the only member of this cast, as far as I'm aware, who has had something like a real career outside of like this kind of made for TV teeny bopper stuff. And and that is not much of a career, but he's I think he played um the the mean jock frenemy in uh the andrew garfield spider-man movies oh flash thompson flash thompson yeah oh okay that that's something he got some money good for him yeah and that's that's clearly so i'm looking at his filmography right now first off he plays a character named mr hottie in the people i've slept with so that's love that that's where we're at but uh yeah he uh he was in yeah the amazing spider-man is is like by far his biggest two films and he was deleted out of his made, made spider-man 2 Great. but uh, he was in shark night i saw that in theaters oh yeah who who was he in oppenheimer uh you know that's a good question but i <laughs> i i can tell you his last released feature was xavier dolan's the death and life of john f donovan oh which suggests to me that xavier dolan watched possibly this very movie and got horny for Brig and decided to cast him in his movie because I'm pretty sure that's how Xavier Dolan casts movies. Yeah. And I think that's swell. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why he casts himself in so many too, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. But the thing that really struck me in this is that there are truly no actors of note in it because usually no. in something like this, you throw in one person who's something. Like you, you get a... You- Loretta you get Divine. Like, yeah, you get like D. Wallace to cameo as like a realtor or something. Yeah, like w- was Barry Bostwick busy? Like he could have been this the dad of the of Madison. Um, exactly. 
yeah, so that that was a little surprising to me. Um, but yeah, no, this cast is just really doing nothing. Um, that does service one of the moments in the movie that made me laugh the most, um, which is a scene, a sequence of Brig and Sky exchanging glances while they are at their lockers. It cuts between them kind of looking over and half smiling and then looking over and half smiling and then looking away and then looking back. Um, I, th- I counted nine cuts back and forth and it lasts for a total of 25 seconds, <laughs> which is like 0.5% of the entire movie is the, just this kind of slow motion exchange of glances. <laughs> you don't just get to 84 minutes. You have to work for it, you know? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, it just, it really, I felt like I was trapped in some sort of time loop Groundhog Day. Um, It just kept going and going and going. It was like one of those bad family guy jokes that doesn't end. Hmm. Um, Or like that scene in Meet Joe Black that has kind of gone viral where Brad Pitt keeps like looking back. Um, It was, it was kind of a glorious, a glorious moment. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is... It is a very charmingly silly and stupid sort of movie in that way. And I I think even though I found the teen drama material kind of flat and unengaging for two reasons, one of which is just that it's it's clearly the the boilerplate we have to clamber through to get to the the kill scenes. Mm-hmm. Um there's a kind of like God, how to how to even characterize it. It's it's got a kind of like post high school musical or maybe even intra high school musical i forget when those movies started but it has that kind of like cheesy smiling energy that i associate Mm. with like a disney channel movie of that sort uh that i feel is at least not slow in a way that this material could certainly have been more of a drag to watch yeah it could have been more of a drag like it's it's not really anything, but it, it's it's like um, it's like when you're on a road trip and you get a gas station treat and you know it's not going to be like some sort of delicious baked good, but it's just a powdered donut and it's going to do the trick and it's kind of nice. Mm. Um, that's that's what this is. It just doesn't. It, it it has no aspirations, nor does it pretend to be anything better than it is. But it's totally palatable, and you can yeah choke and it like, down exactly. And I'm just, I'm just thinking about something like like watching a, a ladder half of the Friday the 13th franchise type thing like like a Friday the 13th 7 and you just think of that desert you have to crawl through when it's just showing us the shitty teens being shitty and this this didn't hit that kind of level of god why isn't this movie moving forward for me yeah and at least has subplots that are kind of interlinking and moving forward they're all very they're all like you said they're all very boilerplate um, but there is some sort of, this is like an episode of a teen drama. Um, yeah. whereas Friday the 13th is like, they are just hanging out, talking about the, the, the that sci-fi kid's talking about the book that he's writing and the black couple is going to fuck in their car. And like, they're, they're just waiting to die. Mm-hmm. And these characters have a, have a mission in my super psycho sweet 16. That That's the thing. Like it's a functional episode of a teen soap that I'm not interested in watching. As opposed to a dysfunctional, like the thing you use to keep the first scene and the third act killing spree separate. Like it it does feel like it exists in a genre. It exists in a storytelling norm of some sort. Mm-hmm, exactly. Just one that I'm not engaged in. Yeah, which is which is fine. Yeah. Um could be worse. Uh there is a sequence uh of people eating sushi off of a mostly naked man, which was a, a, a startling prospect to me for a 16 year old's birthday party, <laughs> but was not mad about seeing it happen. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the slasher of it all, Tim. Let us do so. How did it deliver for you as a slasher movie? You know, worse than a good movie would have delivered, but so much better than I expected it to. Yes. It's kind of, it has no right to deliver it the has times no, that it does. Like, I I don't have it as a good movie, and I know you sort of do, but, like, it shouldn't have come anywhere close to anywhere. Like, it comes so close to being a good slasher movie. 
And I just wasn't prepared for that reality. So I'm I'm like, I think tempted to overrate it for that reason, but I'm trying to resist that temptation. Yeah, and like, like you said, I did rate it higher than you. I don't think I'm overrating it either, but I just had a nice time. Um, but yeah, there's some really solid stuff. And what I, what I would say, there are plenty of kills that do kind of feel like more demure cutaway kills. Like you're not really seeing gore. Um, but they're interspersed between the ones that really are. Um, there's maybe not Argento-esque geysers of blood, but there are some, I would say, two very solid gore moments, and then one kind of after the fact. Uh, you don't really see the kill as it's happening, but you see them discover a body that's pretty mm-hmm. solid, too. Mm-hmm. 100%. I know exactly what you're referring to. I mean, I guess we could just talk about it, because that's what, that's what we do. Right. Um, that 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 kid who's like pinned to the wall like a dissection frog and has his like chest opened up. Yes, it's not a great effect, but it it's more but than it's, you expect. It's more than I expected from a made for TV movie for sure. Uh it it very much reminds me of, of so to go back to my Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven comparison. Like there are the movies like Part Seven where you can tell they got gutted because they ran afoul of the censors. But then there's the films that you can tell they just didn't want to go too hard because they didn't want the censors to take notice. Uh And this feels like one of those where it's like it it sort of has a sense of what the limits are and it's going to walk towards them without really getting to them. But like it's it's not just going for the PG-13, you know, it's it's trying to at least give us a little bit of what we came for. Mm -hmm. So it does have that vibe of like a a sort of slightly cagey mid 80s slasher film in terms of how much gore it's showing us. Mm-hmm. But it does very near the start during that flashback to 1999. We do see uh, a a prop javelin get shoved through the back of the head of the awful birthday boy and emerge through his mouth. Yeah, that is That's, that was really surprising. That was very surprising. It comes quite early in the movie. It's certainly by the 10 minute mark, if not even earlier than that. And it's uh, it's a moment that I feel the film is kind of saying, look, we are going to be going here. We are we are not a children's film. And I just, I think it's a kind of promise that the movie makes. And I think it then actually pays off that promise. Yeah. It pays off in, in certain ways. I think obviously there's the big show stopping kill that I think is, I think anyone would have to say it's unequivocally the best one, um, which is when a, a girl is roller skating away from the killer and gets mm. decapitated and her headless body continues to skate and rams into a giant cake made out of sushi. And- and whilst is skating, little jets of blood coming out of her neck stump. Yes, that is that is excellently conceived. Very it fun. Is, it is the first kill that you come up with when you set a slasher movie in a roller rink. And I was glad to see it. Yes, yes, very, very much. Um, that that was really fun. But I would say even the kills that are more cutaway e or a little more demure. I think they're kind of pushing against the edges of of that rating that they're playing with um, in, in certain ways. Because there's a lot of non-bloody moments that still feel kind of impactful. Like mm-hmm. you see Briggs' head get slammed against a table or um, the that first kid who I'm going to call Ollie because that's a kind of shit-eating 1999 kid name. Mm-hmm. Um, his His ankle snaps when he's roller skating. Um, and you're not seeing any blood or bones poking out or whatever, but you're, you're, you're seeing these non gory moments that are really, you can feel. Um, Mm -hmm. and there's a girl who gets hit in the head with like a toilet tank, like the, the lid of a, of a toilet, uh, I believe is that, Mm -hmm. that happens, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of things like that, that you can, you can, it, 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 it's a little more, it's not bloody, but it's still intense in a certain way. Right. And actually I think it's the same girl who gets hit with the toilet tank. Uh, there's a scene where the killer flings a girl's body across a bathroom and she like bounces off the wall and leaves a little bloody streak where yes. she hit the wall. And like, that's like, that's a little grace note that I feel. Yes. Like you, you didn't go over the top. You didn't make my, you didn't rub my nose in the disgusting gore here, but you did something to sort of amplify the violence and the sense of, of danger here. And I, I appreciate that. Oh, and it is. No, and I think I'm misremembering because one of them gets, I think it's her. She gets like hit in the face with a fire extinguisher too. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, which 
that the fire extinguisher that she was like wielding as a a a weapon. Yes. So it's taken away from her, and then she gets smashed in the face with it. Yeah, that's some that's some intense kind of gnarly shit. Um, and there's a pretty decent chase scene too with um a girl who's keying the beamer that Madison that is Madison's sweet sixteen gift. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously the killer's in the car and turns the car on and starts chasing her down, and for a while she's running in a straight line and I was like, no, don't don't I know what you did last summer this, um, but then she kind of jukes to the right, she takes off her heels so she can run better. Um, and then there's this pretty intense sequence where the killer's coming up the stairs behind her and there's this locked kind of emergency gate and she's trying to climb around the kind of like spikes on the edge that are designed to prevent people from doing that. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty solid sequence. I really enjoyed that as a suspense sequence. Yeah, no, I, in general, the, the last third satisfied me. Like I, it's not one of the great slashers by any stretch of the imagination, but it definitely was like, oh, for for a film in 2009 playing around with these very ancient narrative tropes it's doing so sincerely and it's doing so pretty well like you said it's it's got some pretty good thriller moments which i mean even some excellent slasher movies can't quite make that happen like they really can only operate at the level of like here's a really super gory kill we spend a lot of money on the makeup but they don't always put the effort in to stage this with like actual suspense and I think mm-hmm. this film does. I think the bathroom scene does. I think the chase scene does. Um, it it wants to be a good horror movie, and I guess that's what I wasn't expecting. Yeah, and the the you know the the slasher was so kind of anemic at the time that that this movie came out. Um, obviously, we were deep in the remake cycle at this point. This is Friday the Thirteenth, two thousand nine, came out at this time. That movie actually like a reasonable amount. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just the, the slasher had kind of become a different thing by the time this movie came out. This one's a very, just like Cold Prey, it is, it's kind of going for a meat and potatoes thing. I think it is doing more interesting things than Cold Prey does more often. I definitely liked this better than Cold Prey. Yeah. I'm sorry to say it to Cold Prey. My, my, I feel like Cold Prey is an ex of mine. Cause I did like it a lot <laughs> the first time I watched it. Um, but yeah, totally. It, it it's got some zazz to it. Yeah. Um, and it's also it's a it's a movie that does some fun slasher things, and it also has lines like "It's serendips, deal with it." <laughs> um, I I will say in general, the character of Madison who delivers the line in question, uh, is the most charmingly. 2009 element of this oh, which yeah, makes she, sense she, yeah which makes sense if you think what the property is but like there is just such a, a going all in on these kind of post regina george mean girl things with her mm-hmm. and uh and she's not a better actor than anyone else in the cast but she's also playing i think the major character who is least in need of a good performance by the actor and so i think there's a level of like kitsch yeah, that, for sure. Landing with that character for me. Yeah, and she also she also says the the line "What the WTF? What the WTF? What the WTF?" was my favorite line from this movie. It is good, and and they know it because they did um, MTV apparently only once, but they did air a special edition called the "What the WTF" edition that featured like extra that. interviews and stuff. I love that. Um, and then there, there's one other line that's that wasn't a good line, but just really struck me as far as delivery was from sky rotter um because that that actor she's just not really delivering anything and, but she's also very california and mm. this is something that i've certainly done so i apologize but she talks about her aunt who first of all is not as big of a character as i thought she was going to be no i i was very surprised by how non-present that character was yeah, she's maybe even in one shot of the movie. That sounds plausible. I would need to go back and rewatch it, but that tracks. Certainly not more than three or four shots. She's in one scene. Mm-hmm. And she's kind of giving like a Margaret White vibe. Like if she seems a little intense and weird. Um, and we just don't explore that. But anyway, there's a line where Sky's talking about her aunt. And she says, it's like she thinks I'm the spawn of Satan. Like she just really swallows that The, the, the glottal stop in Satan 
really, really stood out to me. And and if that's a California thing, then your state needs to fall into the sea already. Because that was <laughs> horrible. Um, that's definitely something my sister does. Okay. Um, I don't apologize to your sister. Oh, well, you know, we we do make fun of her. Um, but I think it it's like if you're pushing California more to two thousands Valley Girl, like mm-hmm. whatever that kind of vocal fry thing is, because. Look, I'm from California. I have I have the vocal fry. I do say like instead of um most of the time. That's just that's just how we do, baby. We call it the five. We just this is this is part of it. The free we're talking I'm talking about freeways. I got um, it. I got it. Yeah, I just, I just you know nobody you don't you just don't know. Um but yeah, that 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 felt I felt too exposed. I was like, no, we can't just tell people about this so openly. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, is uh, d- what is something that we haven't mentioned that you didn't like about the movie? Actually, I have a fairly large object level complaint about the film that I sort of nodded at for like ten seconds. Uh, so the movie is called My Super Psycho Sweet Sixteen, and that's already a complaint I have. I think that's the tail wagging the dog because the the title treatment is My Super Sweet Sixteen on two lines. So my sweet line break. Sweet, my super line break, sweet 16. And then those two lines separate and the word psycho sort of floats in like spinning and, and twirling and, and whatnot. Um, I think the title of the movie should be my psycho super sweet 16. Like that is what makes sense given that super sweet 16 is the kind of core phrase here. But they had to, to sort of figure out a way to fit psycho in where it would go. So I'm, I'm slightly annoyed with that, but that's, that's a mm. real, real just in the weeds nitpick. Um, I don't know that I agree with you because okay. as as a phrase in and of itself, super psycho makes more sense than psycho super sweet 16 to me. Um, to, but, to me, to me, the idea was that super sweet 16 is a media property that is being parodied. Mm-hmm. And I think breaking up that phrase sort of diminishes that. Yeah, but that gets, my, that gets to my actual complaint, which is this is much less of a parody of my super sweet 16 than I expected and wanted it to be like, Pro- I, probably i've ne- like i said i've never seen it but well, that feels. I, right. I haven't seen it but i have a sense of what it is i've seen other like entitled awful person has an event shows you know uh the the like uh bridezilla type things mm-hmm. um you know stuff of that nature where like it's kind of selling itself as lifestyle porn. It's like, look and see how the rich people spend their money on this kind of thing. But really the, it's more of like a class warfare in disguise thing where like, we are meant to feel grossed out and we were rooting for this person to suffer. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's my assumption. I haven't seen the show, but like at any rate, I know the hook is meant to be watch this screaming brat get everything she wants because no none of the adults in her life are willing to put any sort of limits around her behavior and there are scenes of that and certainly the opening scene where we see her go to the roller rink and pitch a fit till she gets it and a couple other things um in particular the material around the sushi cake yes which there is a physical prop of a sushi like a a layer cake in the form of a sushi that I thought was so cute. It's I, really adorable. I, I prop a lot. But um I expected more scenes around Madison being just an out of control monster and sort of that being kind of what's being parodied here and it's just not her movie. Like the mm-hmm. the thing she does in this movie is be Briggs's ex. That's a great point. Because the Mai in the title should is her. She is the Mai, exactly. But she's not the lead character. She's not the lead character. She's she's not even really like a, a co-lead. She is just the obstacle to Brig and Sky being able to get together. Yeah. Oh, that's a really, really good point. And if you're talking about it being a parody of that kind of show, this was the perfect moment in time for this to be a mockumentary. Mm-hmm. Um which I think would have made it more interesting. Not that it's not interesting as it is. I I do wonder if making this a mockumentary would have overtaxed the ability of the 
the crew making it because it is still an MTV movie. Mm, and the actors for sure. And the actors for sure. Like, I don't think you're going to get a behind the mask level of intelligence out of this production. Although I will say the uh, the director who hasn't really done anything that's like super good, but like appeared to have a desire. So the director is Jacob Gentry. Um appears to have wanted to make sure that this wasn't just like corny brand cash in bullshit. He wanted to make sure mm. it was actually like a legit movie that was being made to like have a, a proper narrative. So maybe there would have been something there that he could have like actually done something with a mockumentary, but I feel like that's, that's asking a lot of what this property is to have been good at being a mockumentary. I think you're right. But I just think this is this is this is coming right at the time that like um mockumentary television was really mm-hmm. on the rise as far as the office and modern family and that whole thing and also the rise of that early 2010s wave of found footage. Like mm-hmm. this really could have been at the beginning of something. Oh, I'm not saying you could not do this as a mockumentary. Yeah, I'm they saying maybe could not. The MTV original would have not I think succeeded at that. Yeah, that is fair. And I I think it does succeed cinematically in a couple different ways that a mockumentary wouldn't have. Um, Like the transition from that opening scene of her in Mm -hmm. the like abandoned uh, roller rink to the flashback to when it was vibrant. Um, It transitions via like certain neon lights turning on and the camera panning. And that's a, it was a very elegant transition. It was, absolutely, yes. Um, There's also a jump scare that kind of got me. Uh, which I was surprised by. Maybe I was just, you know, pr- again, right I think the fact that there was a good jump scare in this movie was the surprise. And, you know, it's easy to over respond to it. Very much. But, you know, and, so it's, it's oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, and um, I think they did. Uh, there is a moment that I noticed that is very much a Tom Savini uh, killer's weapon trick. Uh, so in the burning in the raft scene where the killer is using garden shears to kill just a whole bunch of people on a raft. Um, there's a part early on before any of the blood happens where the killer misses and the garden shears like nick the side of the raft and kind of carve a chunk of wood out. Mm -hmm. Um, and that shot is there to clue the viewer into like, this is a real weapon. This is heavy. This can do damage before you cut to the special effects in the fake weapon. Mm hmm. Um, and there's a moment in this movie where the killer it's in that third act that we're talking about where the killer's chasing um, Sky and Madison and whatever and accidentally knocks over a pile of glasses with this big heavy axe and they all kind of shatter. Mm. And I, I think that delivered a similarly effective kind of subtle. Uh, I, I hadn't thought of that in the moment, but I think that's a really, really keen observation. I, I think that's very, very true. Thank so you. yeah, no, like the filmmaking chops here are real. Um, again, I think that there is a desire to make this the best disposable made for TV teen slasher that they could. And I, I appreciate that. The, the thing I got to thinking of weirdly, um, there is a season seven episode of the X files called X cops. <laughs> okay. Where it starts out as an episode of the Fox show cops, which if you are unfamiliar with it, the property has been off the air for many years, but basically it was, it was just like ride along footage where you, you watched cops being cops. And sometimes they were just like driving around looking for crimes and not finding any. So they were just chatting with each other. And sometimes they have to pull over people for these really unbelievably boring and pedestrian, you know, drunken, drunk driving things. And very rarely they get to do something more interesting. And so there's this X-Files episode that starts out that way. We're just like basically watching a generic episode of cops branded as as cops as the the fox show cops that's and fascinating then, and then at a certain point Mulder and scully show up in this episode of cops and now they're with the cops and so we're sort of riding along with Mulder and scully and cops and then at a certain point later still the paranormal creature that Mulder and scully have been hunting drifts into this episode of cops and that's kind of, I think, what I was wanting this to be. And that gets back to your, mm. could it have been a mockumentary thing? Like, it doesn't feel like a slasher has entered an episode of My Super Sweet 16. It feels like like one of several hundred, the, the lives of teenagers get interrupted by a slasher movie from the 80s that uses the Super Sweet 16 branding and has that be like 
instead of a Labor Day picnic, it's a Sweet Sixteen party. But that's mm-hmm. it's about that level of of depth. Yeah, and that that is a bummer. You are right. It it with this with the thing that it was advertising itself to be, it could have leaned in even more, and e- even in ways that wouldn't have been as challenging, um, given the 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 resources they had. Yeah, even just just a couple more scenes of Madison being being pissy would have is all I all I needed because we really only get the one with the cake. Yeah, and then sort of sort of again at the end. Um, Spoiler alert, but uh, it's, I think, the one, like, genuinely unexpected scene in this movie to me. Um, at the end, we think Sky is Sky going to kill or Sky going to not kill. She frees Madison, who is the last victim standing. And Madison is, like, surprised and pleased to have been freed. And, and we, we get the sense that she's understood that she's uh, been mean to Sky this whole time and that was wrong. And then she immediately pivots back to, I can't believe you ruined my party. Uh huh, and and that is I think I think the one other moment that really is like oh this this is what this movie could have been if it was letting Madison be more of a figure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <sighs> yeah, that's too bad. Um, and there's a, there's a couple other things that just aren't aren't great about the movie. I mean, everything's so shiny. It's like everything's the, so shiny. The digital but, of know, it all, you know, it you know it's made for TV movie from 2009. I, there's a point where I, I don't like a thing, but I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to yell at a duck for having a beak and wings, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and also as much as, um, with the exception of that pretty, pretty solid receiver joke, this movie seems unaware that sex exists in a, in a way that's, kind of perplexing to me um like there's a really gross scene where the party planner guy is attempting to assault madison like right before she makes her big debut at the party mm-hmm. um and she said she basically she like fends him off and then says something like if you think i'm gonna kiss you you have another thing coming and i was like i don't think that's what he wanted madison um and there's a couple scenes like that where they imply something and then immediately back off and talk about kissing and it just it it didn't compute it did it does feel really weird in that respect and and i agree with you that scene was just such a strange just weirdly gross add-in that is narratively inconsequential like the party planner does not return he is not uh, like set up as a fake like a red herring for the killer which i thought might have been where they were going uh, he's just there so they can get a weird, like, handsy 35-year-old joke in the film. I will say that the actor who plays the party planner is named Chad McKnight, which would have been an awfully good name for Brig Jenner if it hadn't already been taken by one of the cast. <laughs> yeah, may- maybe the sequel will have a Chad McKnight running around. That is that is, that is, that is just a... That, that is a name. Oh, my God. That's all I'm saying. It really is. Um... Okay, I th- I think I'm tapped out on this movie. Is there anything else that you you feel like deserves? I I think we we've covered it. I mean, it's as much as was true with Cold Prey. It is, it is a boilerplate slasher movie. It's following the template. It's it's maybe slightly over indexing on the teen soap elements because of what it's doing and what its market is. But it's it is not a film that is designed to surprise you with anything it's doing. I just think it surprised me with the fact that it was doing it sort of well. Yeah. Which I was I was really I was expecting this to be just garbage. And it's not. It's certainly not garbage. Yeah, it is it is certainly a non unpleasant experience. It's not like I, I don't know if I'd advise anyone to like rush out and see it, but it's certainly like if you're into slashers and haven't, and especially if you're into like two thousand nine cultural iconography, I think it's a totally nice time on your couch. I know, I completely agree. Um there are way worse slashers from this period for sure. I think the biggest impediment to me saying, yeah, check it out is that it is actually quite hard to lay hands on. Uh, as you had to turn me on to the only place it exists. And as I found legally or illegally is uh, a rental on um, Apple iTunes. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm glad for it was, it was three ninety nine, And I, I think it is actually, a purchase so I, I am the proud owner of my super psycho sweet 16 um so yeah maybe you don't want to spend four bucks on it but uh i don't know i i i enjoyed myself so if it, if it sounds worth investing in to you it probably is like if, if you, you think you it's and i up your alley 
you and I have both absolutely spent more money to own worse slasher films. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I I have owned Friday the 13th three times. So yeah. I can I can afford to to digitally own my super sweet 60 Sega Super Sweet, whatever the fuck it's called. I can own it once. Yeah, and um the the slasher movie that was my number one worst movie of the 1980s, which listen to that episode on the main feed of Alternate Ending, I own that on Blu-ray. <laughs> I love that for you. Also, if you do listen to that episode on the main feed, uh, have a good stiff whiskey in front of you because Carrie's going to say some things that are are going to make you sad. <laughs> it's a dark time. It's a dark time. <laughs> anyway, that, that's going to do it for our discussion on My Super Psycho Sweet 16. You can find that episode we were talking about as well as more episodes with me, Tim, Carrie, uh, uh, everyone uh, at alternateending.com. Also, Tim's reviews, sometimes my reviews. I've I've been busy. We've both been busy, but yes. you're you're back, Tim. You've been doing a bunch of horror sure. in October. I'm try, uh, trying to trying to get back in it. Just uh, yeah, try to to not let movies be five months old before I finally review them. Look, we we all do what we have to do. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we haven't actually decided what our theme for next month is going to be yet, but if you are on the Patreon, stay tuned. There will be a poll coming to you reasonably soon. Do you think that there are at least five Hanukkah themed horror movies? No. <laughs> Do you think there is a single Hanukkah themed horror movie? Yes. I believe there are two that I can name off the okay. top of my head. Well, we, but... we only need two episodes. <laughs> oh boy. I mean, I have thought about it. I've thought about it. Uh, because I do like to expand representation beyond just Christmas. Because that's I, I I am a proud I'm a proud veteran of the war on Christmas. <laughs> um, but it's just there's just there's nothing there. Like just Hanukkah movies in general. Like you've basically got Adam Sandler in Eight Crazy Nights, um, and that's kind of the the list. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's a different conversation. But yes, we, uh, if you are on the Patreon, keep an eye out for that poll. Uh, you can choose the first episode, the first movie that we watch for that uh, month. And if you're not on the Patreon, you can join the Patreon at any level, and you will be able to participate in those polls. That uh, there'll be a link to that in the show notes. But yes, thank you so much for listening, and you know, catch you, catch you on the flip side, everybody. Uh, bye bye. <laughs> She hates me.